Well, a good morning. How is everyone enjoying spring? Are we here? Spring has come. Oh, amen. We're going to see flowers and blooms. It's going to be great. I, I'm wanting to jump right into God's Word. I'm going to invite you to turn Revelation chapter 2. We're going to get right into things starting at verse 18. Revelation 2, picking up at verse 18. This is the letter to the church to the body of believers in Thyatira. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like like burnished bronze. As in all the previous letters, Jesus is very quick to let the people know, this is Jesus giving you this information. It continues, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Isn't that encouraging? I know your love and your deeds, and I know that you are doing more than you did at first. What's the next word? But nevertheless, depending on the translation, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Does that not sound like the letter to Pergamum last week? They were caught up with false teaching, listening to false prophets, sexual immorality, eating food sacrificed to idols. Here we are, different church, 40 miles apart. And when I say church, I mean the gathering of people. 40 miles apart, the believers in Jesus caught up in the same thing. Jesus continues, "Uh, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling, so I will cast her into the bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. That isn't her children, that is those who are following her teaching, those who are following her ways and being caught up in the sinful natures and desires that she's teaching. Now I say, now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold on to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we are in your word this morning, God, I pray that your word challenges us. It encourages us and strengthens us. And God, we ask that as we're in your word, we as individuals, we as a church body, are challenged to do more and to do better. God, we thank you for the grace that you've given us. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And God, through each of those, we are able to be in relationship with you. We thank you for that. God, we ask a blessing on those who are here, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have this letter to the believers in Thyatira. This is the fourth letter, the fourth church that is written to in the book of Revelation. Last week we were, if you remember, in Pergamum. Pergamum was our inland city. The first two were harbor towns, then we moved inland to Pergamum. From Pergamum we moved to Thyatira, another inland city 40 miles southeast of Pergamum. They're about 50 miles from the shore. Here we have this inland city of Thyatira. You may recognize that name, Thyatira. Anyone recall a lady who's connected with that town? Lydia, a merchant, someone who sells purple cloth. The book of Acts tells us about Lydia, and she helped out 
the Apostle Paul. This is the town. We've only got a couple instances where we hear of this place, Thyatira. Those are the letter in Revelation, and then in, in Acts we see it as well. The people in Thyatira are very similar to the people in Pergamum, caught up with the false teachings, caught up with sexual immorality, caught up with the idolatry, the eating food sacrificed to idols. The difference between the two is Pergamum was listening to teachers outside the church, and here we have these believers in Thyatira listening to a prophetess who's connected to the church. Sin has gotten into the church, and Jesus is saying to them, the same as the other churches, repent and turn. We go from there, we're moving into Sardis this week. Sardis is our fifth letter. As we go from Thyatira to Sardis, it's about 25 miles to the south to the town of Sardis. Sardis was a town on a hill, similar to Pergamum, but a lot of roads all connected there. It was like a crossroads, if you will. They were placed up on a hill. That hill had given them almost a false sense of security. They felt high in the hill, couldn't be attacked, yet this place was still attacked a few times. So the people there had a sense of insecurity, and Jesus is trying to write to them to give them faith, to give them security. Revelation 3, we will pick up there. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, I have these, or sorry, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Again, Jesus, very quick in this letter, letting the people know this is Jesus who holds the seven spirits and the seven stars. That number seven, if you remember, is a symbol of fully and completely. And Jesus holds the fullness and completeness. He continues, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Imagine that coming in a letter. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. He continues, wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. They are given a wake-up call. Maybe that's someone's wake-up call that we're hearing <laughs> Anyone ever have a wake-up call at, at a hotel or set an alarm clock? That's something you've ever done? I know when I was on board ship, they had this fancy little whistle. And I know I have a few people that will relate to that. It's called a bosun's call. And they would play this annoying, for a lack of a better word, about a minute-long whistle that had high and low pitches and trills, and they called it Wakey Wakey, and this was broadcast throughout the ship. The best place for Wakey Wakey was to already be awake. That, that's what I've learned, and so if you were on watch, that was the right spot. And they would play this, and I also had the privilege of hearing Reveille, which is the Army's version similar to that, and it was a wake-up call. There's a couple things I know about a wake-up call. I didn't want to hear it. That's the one thing. When it came, I didn't want to hear it. And when I did hear it, it meant it was time to move. It was time to do something about it. Maybe some of you get up this morning to a wake-up call or an alarm clock. Maybe there's some at home who haven't gotten up to that yet. <laughs> but we have a wake-up call that's given to this church, to these people in Sardis. Jesus is telling them to wake up. And he continues, remember therefore what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. This isn't the first time Jesus says that. I'll come like a thief, meaning you're not going to know when I come. I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time that I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they, sorry, for, for they are worthy. They're dressed in white because they are worthy. They have not soiled their clothes, meaning the, there's some people in Sardis. There's some hope here. There's people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. 
They're not caught up in all the sin and sexual immorality and the idolatry. There are a few that are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is writing to Sardis to change, to wake up and change. I don't know if you read the paper yesterday. It it was brought to my attention just this morning that in the paper yesterday there was an article about church and about a decline in church. And I may be reading it wrong, but how it seemed to be worded is there's churches that are seeing growth, and that's by them as a church accepting the values of the people around them as opposed to having the people around them accept the values of Scripture. That isn't how a church is to grow, right? But here we have these churches, these seven letters being written to the believers, and we see this call to change, to wake up. Jesus is giving a church message 2,000 years ago, but I think the message could hold true today. We began our year. I don't know if you're one for numbers, but we're a quarter of the way into 2019. Boom, gone. Just like that. We began our year with being better together. And if you remember, our plan was to be better together as a body of believers. And there was a handful of things that we as a body should be doing. And our message today points to some of those because it's so important that we as a group do these things and that we become better together. This is a message to wake up and strengthen. So as a church, how do we, how do we in Montague strengthen? How do we strengthen what remains is what is said to Sardis. I think the neat thing is we are in a church with a rich history. It's a rich history in the community for being here for many, many, many years. It has a rich history in many families in the community in a rich history in many families here today. So the question is, how do we strengthen that and strengthen what remains? I want you to think about an athlete. Any, anyone here athletic or no high competitive athletes? Would you say many of them are strong? Would that be fair to say? Then why do they keep training? to maintain, to build and maintain, right? And so we need to continue to grow and build. Just like an athlete builds and strengthens, we need to as well. You see bodybuilders, and they still go to the gym. We see athletes, and they still work out and train. So what does it take for us to strengthen our faith? If we're going to strengthen our faith as a body of believers here in Montague, what does it take to strengthen our faith? I think that in order to strengthen our faith, we must be connected. That's our first thing. We need to be connected not only to each other, not only connected to each other, we need to be connected to God and connected to God's Word. Is that a picture of us? Is that a picture of us individually, you and I? Is that a picture of us as a body of believers? Are we connected? Connected to others and connected to God and His Word. You see, Sardis had a reputation of being alive, but what did Jesus say they were? Dead. Spiritually dead. That means, if we want to look at it, they didn't just show up to church, they did something with it. That's that's what's being called of here. So it's not a question of looking connected. It's not a question of do we look like we're connected. It's a question of are we connected? Are we spiritually connected with others and to God? Does our life line up with Scripture? If we open up God's Word, does our life fit into Scripture? Does it fit into God's Word? Are we more like God's Word or are we more like the world? Are we an example of a Christ follower in all that we do? 
when we think of being connected to God, how is our prayer life? How is our time in Scripture? Are we connected? I'm going to read from Psalm 1. Feel free to turn there or just open your ears. Psalm 1, the psalmist wrote, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, he, and on his law he meditates day and night. On his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. That's a picture of being connected to God, to meditate day and night on God's Word. Further, are we connected to other believers? Are we connected enough to other believers that we can challenge them, that they can challenge us, that we can love on them and they can love on us, that we can turn to them and they can turn to us? Are we connected to other believers? You see, like in that article in The Guardian, there's ones that want their values brought into the church, but as a church, we need to move God's values out and meet them. Are we connected? If we're going to strengthen our faith, then we need to be connected. Connected to believers who challenge us and connected to God and His Word, which strengthens us. In order to strengthen our faith, we must be next committed. What does commitment look like? What's commitment look like in your house, in your life, in your job, in your family? What does commitment look like? I watched a video on the plane and it was of top athletes. You probably recognize a couple of these names. Wayne Gretzky, he was one, and Michael Jordan. Two top athletes in their field. And what made them a cut above the others in their field? Their commitment. They had a commitment to train. They had a commitment to their team. They had a commitment to the game itself. They were committed. So if we're going to strengthen our faith, we need to be committed. What are the things that we need to be committed to? We need to be committed to those same things, to other believers, to God, to God's Word. When we look at 2019 as a year, we look at the news, we look in maybe the newspaper, articles on TV, Commitment is something that's lacking in a lot of lives. Just to name a few things, people are lacking commitment with their family, with their friends, jobs, finances, their faith. Commitment seems to be a scary word. We look even in our society that people are looking to be common law instead of married because they're staying away from commitment. People are, are trying to avoid things that that tie them into commitment. But yet that's what we're being called to do as Christians, is to be committed. This letter to Sardis was a wake-up call. And I think that we as believers need a wake-up call too. We need to be brought into shape, if you will, and be committed back to our faith be committed to God and be committed to God's Word. When I think quick of the time I spent with Shane and Veld in Romania, it was a beautiful picture of a committed couple. Committed to each other, committed to God, committed to their work, and they just poured everything into what they did. And I think, imagine if each and every one of us in this church, in this community, just had that same attitude of whatever it takes, I'll just do that. 
the young girl that works with them had just made a, a sidebar comment to me. Uh, and she'd be young, early 20s, and she's like, do you know what I love about Shane and Velda? And to me, I'm thinking lots, like that would be my answer. <laughs> and she said that it wouldn't matter what it was. If I said, I think this sidewalk, we just need to pick the garbage up here today, they'd be like, all right, let's just, let's do that. It didn't matter what, there was no task too big, too small. They're just committed to what they did. And I think how different would our church, our community, our family, our life be if we just had that attitude of commitment. If we're going to strengthen our faith, we need to be committed. So back to, to what does commitment look like? Are we committed to being in prayer and in God's word daily? Is that a picture of you and I? Are we committed to be in fellowship with other believers who challenge us and strengthen us? Are we committed to be in church weekly? We meet weekly. Are we committed? Because that brings us to our next point of consistency. Consistency means something different to different people. I remember being at the dentist one day. And the one thing I learned is don't be smart with the one who's got tools in your mouth. But... She asked the question, do you consistently floss? And I said, yes. She said, what do you call consistently? I said, the day before every dentist appointment. <laughs> like, what do you call consistently? But as funny as I found that at the time, I think there's people in their faith that they call consistently Christmas and Easter. They call consistently every six weeks. If we're going to strengthen our faith, consistent means that we meet together weekly. That we're committed and consistent to our faith. Just like any top athlete, the thing that separated them from the rest of the pack was things like consistency. I don't know how familiar you are with ones like Sidney Crosby, but as a kid, he would shoot puck after puck after puck in his basement. Or we look at Wayne Gretzky, and he would spend hours on technique and on shooting and on skills. We look at Michael Jordan, and he was always early to the game, and he'd be shooting hoops and shooting hoops. They modeled consistency. And because of their consistency, their team modeled their consistency. So as leaders in the church, we need to model consistency <coughs> so that those around us will see it and they'll model that same consistency. Consistency is the one thing that separated those top athletes. There's a quote that Gretzky gave and it said, no matter who you are, we're creatures of habit the better your habits are, the better they will be in pressure situations. We live in a life where there is going to be pressure. There's going to be things that come up. And if our habits will be the things that get us through the pressure, then the question is, what are your habits? Is it spending time with God, spending time in prayer, spending time with believers, spending time here in fellowship? And if it is, we can handle the pressure. So just as the church in Sardis had a wake-up call, today I believe there's a wake-up call for each and every one of us here in Montague. So I'm going to ask you the questions. Are you connected? Are you committed? And are you consistent? And not in the way that we have a reputation of looking alive, but in a way that we are spiritually alive. And if that's not you, then this morning, I'm going to challenge you to wake up. Let's pray. God and Father, we thank you that we can gather in your house this morning. We thank you for the many blessings that
we have been given. But God, there's times that we need to open our eyes and see what's around us, to see you guiding us and leading us and to be willing to follow that lead. God, I pray if there's ones here who have a desire to wake up, a desire to follow your lead, a desire to make a commitment to your son Jesus, that this morning they reach out to one of those who leads here, that we can walk them through the salvation process. We can walk them into a saved relationship with you. God, I pray if there's those who have things on the go in their life, that they need to make a change like these churches that we're seeing in Asia Minor did, that, God, they make those changes today because today is our day to wake up, our day to put our trust into you, and our day to follow you and follow the example of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray and give you our thanks. Amen.